Gober used to say, uh, Matt Gober used to say that pride makes excuses, humility makes changes. And uh, so, and, and John's done a really good job of teeing this up because I want to wrap up Victoria's Secrets today and I will not be long at all. And uh, just so y'all know, my plan is to not be long at all. But I want you to go, uh, I want you to go to the book of Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. I'm going to start at verse 11. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Y'all let John know you appreciate him sharing his heart like that. That, that means a lot to me. This man has become such a part of our family that when he walks in the room, he, he as far as I'm concerned, can say anything he wants whenever he's ready. Uh, and he usually does it anyway. But um, I like to think I give him permission, but he just, you know, he's, he's Papa John. He can do what he wants. Um, and that's okay. When you've got somebody with the experience that he has or anybody in your life, you need to listen to him. You really do. Matthew 23, 11, uh, I'm going to read the New Living Translation, but uh, Matthew 23, 11 says, The greatest among you must be a servant, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. My question is, how low can you go? We, we live this life where we think we give everything to God. We think we do. Um, we're so used to church. We're so used to coming together as a family. We're so used to, to the right songs and if everything's the right way and if everything's going great and everybody's serving. And, and we're at church and praise the Lord, we're having a good time. And, and, and oh, it's just so anointed today. But are we really trusting God with everything? Because trusting God with everything means when you leave here, are you picking back up the stresses that you didn't think about for 20 minutes? Now, this, this scripture says, And whosoever shall exalt himself, say himself, and he that shall humble who? God does not humble you. That is a lie that the church has perpetrated. What does it say? He that shall humble who? Himself. himself. How do you humble yourself? This is not about being the most prideful person in the room. People read this and they think, well, I'm not. I'm not that person. Well, there's your pride right there. <laughs> but the truth is, is what we have to understand, what this is talking about, this, this type of humbleness, this type of humility, this is taking you to a place where you look at yourself as if you're not able to serve because something's wrong. And that within itself is his own form of pride. Because for some reason you think that something on the inside of you is bigger than the goodness on the inside of him. You've put yourself in a position to believe that you've done, said, been around, looked at, said, tasted, put, put around you something that God can't seem to over, overcome. And the truth is it's time we start giving people what Jesus paid for, not what you think you can't get free from. Those who exalt themselves... And then those who humble themselves. How do you humble yourself? Just what John just talked about. Taking a moment and giving thanks no matter where you're at in life. I know all of you. I know, I know where you've been. I know most of your stories. I know the, the, what we've been through together. I know all these things. But the truth is, that's what you want me to know. I don't ever really meet everybody here except for my kids and my wife. The truth is, is I meet the person you want me to meet. That's who I meet. And... It's the person that you are that you don't want to share with anybody. That's the person that this scripture is talking about. Because the truth is, we're in a day and age in the church. Now listen, I, I, I believe in grace. I believe in loving people where they are. I believe that everybody's victorious. I believe that everybody's a champion. And I believe that everybody's valuable. Y'all know that about me. I also believe that we ain't such a big deal. I believe we spend way too much time talking about how we're champions instead of we're in the one who was our champion. I think we've spent way too much time exalting ourselves in Christ and not really being in Christ. We've gotten to the place that it's our spiritual, it's our spiritual calisthenics. As long as we do this and as long as we do that, everything's going to go good. Let me tell you what you, all you have to do. All you have to do is love him, thank him, and be close to him. Everything else in your life will begin to line up, but you've got to make those steps first. Now, go with me to the book of James, chapter 4. Y'all okay this morning? 
Cameron, you might want to, will you come bump this air down a notch or two? We changed out the light bulb so we, weren't, we were able to not run the air so cold, and I think we've kind of went the other way a little too much. So uh, James chapter 4, verse 10. <clears throat> James chapter 4, verse 10. I'm, again, I'm reading new Liv- the New Living. He's putting the King James on the screen. Um, Humble yourselves. There it is again. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And what will happen? He will lift you up in honor. The King James says it this way. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. See, when you try to make yourself better or the winner or, or it, it, okay, we're, 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 what, 27 days from football season? Who knows? 26, 26. I knew I was close. You know, I feel Jesus when it gets close to football season. You know why? Because I'm having to pray my way through sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you need to get these Alabama fans first. That's what you need to do. You notice that? It just got quiet. Uh, don't be roll tied me. If you can't say amen, if you can't say amen, don't you say it roll tied. Don't you do it. So, <laughs> what was I at? I'm, I'm on kickoff. I'm on Chick fil A kickoff day. Listen. <laughs> There is no such thing, there is no such thing as the star player on a team. I can't remember the names. It's a story I used to tell a long time ago, but it was in the 80s. There was a, uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates had drafted a a guy, and he'd been been on the team a couple years. You know, he'd made a few million dollars, and, and he was the best pitcher in the league. Best pitcher in the league. His stats were unbelievable. And he went to, he went to the manager of the, the Pirates, and he said, look, these are my stats. I, I outpitch everybody in Major League Baseball. And I realize you're paying me millions, but I want to raise. I want what this person is making. I want, you know, because we see that a lot today in sports. Now, you don't see this kind of guts anymore in sports, but this is what this manager said. This manager said, you're not getting a raise. And he said, why? I think I deserve it. He said, you know what? All of these stats, you're that good. But where did we finish? And he said, well, we finished in last place. And he said, I can do that without you. Because it doesn't matter how well you do in your own self. It matters how well you do in him. Because the truth is not about your actions. It's not about your works. It's about your ability to get lower and lower, less and less of you and more and more of him. When I say how low can you go, this ain't the conga line. This ain't, this ain't, this ain't one of them games y'all be playing y'all don't tell me about. How to this is one of those things where, <laughs> where you got to get down and understand that it's really not about your ability but his. Amen. He gets to put his super on your natural. Amen. But the truth is this. I can't shouldn't exist in your vocabulary. Y'all have heard me tell this story, but since John's here, I'll tell it. When we first met, uh, and I'm going to use you a lot today, so get comfortable. Uh, I'm going to pick on him. Because uh, trust me, next three days, he's going to be picking on me a lot. John, when we first met John, John found out about who we were and my aviation, uh, the Lord, what the Lord spoke to me about aviation. And John calls me. We've never met before. Now, this has been three or four years ago now. John, we'd never met before. And John calls me, and, and he found out who I was and who my family was and what we were doing here. And the Lord spoke. He didn't, this has got nothing to do with our connections with different men. This has got to do with the Lord speaking to him. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm supposed to help you. And he calls me, and he sends me this king course. And he says, I want you to learn a da 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 and then I'll call you on Thursday. Now, this was on a Monday. I don't know if you remember all this. I do because it changed my world. He calls me on a Thursday. Now, he's in Dallas, Texas, Fort Worth, Texas. I'm in, I'm in Jasper, Alabama. He calls me on Thursday. He said, where are you at? I said, I'm on the last module, which is several modules you have to watch videos of. And he said, okay, okay, I'm in Tupelo. I'll be there in two hours. I said, you're where? Now, if y'all didn't catch that, we'd never met before, and he's coming to my house. Is that, that's the truth. My wife's like, what? Hey. <laughs> So it's like, Bailey's, you know, everybody's like running around cleaning and stuff and getting a room ready for him and all that. And he comes into town 
And there's a long story about chainsaws and trees and all this kind of stuff. But the truth is this. We, we got into this training, and I would say, just get me in the plane. I'm good in the plane. This book work, I, uh, I don't test well. I can't. And he would yell at me, you have the mind of Christ. And I'm like, who are you in my house? You yelling at me in my house. <laughs> and then my wife, my wife goes, looks like you've met you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> So, but he pushed me. He pushed me to understand that the creator of aviation is in here. Amen. And I got, I had to push into it. That it wasn't about my knowledge. It was about my ability to be, to, to, to go lower. Doesn't mean that I don't do the work. Doesn't mean that you don't put in the effort. It doesn't mean any of those things. What it means is that you get to the place where you do your part, but you certainly expect him to do his. But we're not expecting him to do his anymore. We're trying to fix it all ourselves. We're trying to be the star on the team. We're trying to be on our own team. We're trying to be a one-man show. Everybody, you know, we, we're talking about sports. Everybody loves, oh, you know, he's a playmaker. He's a playmaker. Not if you lose. What does it matter who the playmaker is? What, what does it matter who the best preacher is, the best singer? What does that matter if the church is dwindling down and nobody's seeing Jesus? We have a whole lot of churches built on personalities. We have a low, whole lot of churches built on charisma and smoke and mirrors. And we have a whole lot of churches built on music. And all, I, listen, I, I, don't you love our praise team? Aren't they awesome? But if they're all on tour, praise the Lord, and we have a CD, you should still be able to worship whether they're here or not. Because he's that good. Amen? All right. Go Proverbs. Proverbs 16 and 18, one, uh, put that up in the uh, uh, message translation, please. Proverbs 16 and 18. Proverbs 16 and 18. First pride, I love the message translation because it puts it plain. First pride, then the crash. <laughs> now, we don't use that language in our world, but... but First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Now, let me explain something to you about this text. This is not always about the haughty person. This is about the person that continually tells you how they can't because they don't have the goods. Because that's just as prideful. And people see pride as big, arrogant attitude. But there's more pride in believing you can't because you believe that you're so special you're outside of what Jesus died for. And you may not see it that way, but that's how the enemy is using it against you. See what you did? See, Jesus can't do nothing for you, which is a lie from the pit of hell. You're called. Listen, this is what you're called to do. We're living in a day and age where people don't understand what being in church really means. We're doing church our own way. Well, thank you for your amens. We're doing church how we want to do it. And we're, listen, oh my gosh, if you don't like the way we do it, you can find 20 other churches in 20 other miles that are doing it the way you want them to do it. But the truth is, how does he want it done? He wants it done to where no matter what we do with lights and paint and all this different stuff, no matter what we do, as long as it shows him. Do you see him in the people that, that, that you run into? Do people see him in you and the people that you minister to? Do people see him? In, now, now, look, I know in here everybody got their church face on. But, you know, in an hour and a half when you're sitting in a restaurant and they don't got your food wrong, where's Jesus? Is he there? He's there, but are you letting him out? <laughs> listen, hangry. Don't we talking about hangry? <laughs> somebody, just, somebody brought up hangry. Now, listen, we're talking about Victoria's Secrets. We talked about overcoming fear. We talked about overcoming doubt. We talked about overcoming lack. And it's great if you're not afraid. And it's great if you don't doubt yourself. And it's great. Listen, it is absolutely great if you're out of lack and you got plenty more to put in store. But what matters most is that you overcome you. You are your... Quit blaming the devil. Nothing drives me crazier than when somebody says, well, the devil, well, who let him in? Do you really know who you are in Christ? Because if you know who you are in Christ, you don't even have to listen. That's right. Amen. Let, me, let me explain something to you. 
uh, if, you're, if you are a supervisor on a job and you're in charge and you're responsible for that entire multi-million dollar job that's got to be built in the next 30 days, and some guy that's walking down the street sip, sipping on Starbucks, you know, in his, in his sandals, <laughs> ain't never built nothing before in his life, but he's going to come up and start telling you what you need to do next and how you're doing that wrong. Do you even listen to that guy? You know why? Because he has no authority and no experience to tell you what to do. That is what Jesus gave you over the enemy. You have the right to not pay attention. And by the way, it's all lies. He's a sower of lies, which means everything in him is lies. He's a sower of fear, which means he's afraid. He's a sower of doubt, which means he's even doubting himself of whether he can get to you. I mean, we, we've painted him as this big red devil with a pitchfork. And the truth is, as God says, he's like a bug who he knocked off his shoulder. So it's you. It's you that you've got to overcome. Your ability to listen to the right voice. Your ability to put the right people around you. Your ability to hear what God has to say to you and about you and for you and through you. Because God never speaks to you that he doesn't have something he wants to get through you. He's called you to change people's lives with the words he says, not your words. Listen, we have to stop hearing God a little bit and putting a lot of us in it. We have to start hearing what he has to say and say what he has to say. Amen. When you get to that point, this, this becomes moot right here. First pride, then the crash. Well, you know, I hear people all the time that say stupid stuff like this. Well, if I walk in that church, a door will fall in. First of all, we build things a little better than that. <laughs> Secondly, you think, you, you think things that you've done weren't worth to be put on the cross. It's not that you think that. Now, trust me, listen to me. It's not that you think that in a haughty way. You think that in a broken way. But in the spirit, it's still pride. And we have to break through that. We have to break through the place that, that when we get real clear clean and clear before the Lord that it's not about your ability to do something for him, but his ability to do something in you. And when he gets, in, when he gets something in you done, then he can begin to use you to do something for him. Too many broken people are trying to do something for him and they're not put back together yet. The stitches haven't, haven't healed up yet. I, I've had a few surgeries in my life, nothing major, but a few. And, and I was always told the same thing. Uh, especially when I, when I had my gallbladder out, I was told, little bitty cuts, big, big surgery, <laughs> which meant don't get out there and start lifting weights or, or doing that stupid stuff you do, throwing you know, things around and building and blah, 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 because my, my doctor knew me, and they know how stubborn I am, and uh, I ain't even looking. <laughs> I ain't even looking. And the truth is, they were right, because... I'm always trying to find a way to just keep going. And most of us are that way. Most of us are driven and not led. Amen. Amen. When we're flying, this only happened one time, thank you, Jesus. We were landed at JFX in Prattville. And I put both hands on the yoke. And he slapped my hand. What are you laughing at? Because <laughs> yeah, he knows that's a no-no. He slapped my hand, and, and it took everything within me from giving him the eyebrow. And he said, you don't drive it, you fly it. Because I say I was off the throttle, which means we're still, we, we may take, I'm not slowing this thing down. He was training me. And the truth is, is that taught me something, because now every time my hand goes up, I feel that pop. It's true. I, I, it's, I'm, it's It's true. I didn't like it at the time, but I'm thankful for it now. Because what's happening is this. I realized that what I knew about movement in a car didn't translate to the same type of movement. You go in the same speed. When you hit the ground, you're very similar to the speed of a car. But you don't drive an airplane. And I was trying to do what I knew. And so many people are trying to do in the Spirit what they know versus stopping and letting the Holy Spirit talk to them. Because you cannot drive with the Lord. You have to be led. Matter of fact, you're just a passenger. You're just hanging out. You're just in the car. I mean, you're not even the navigator. You barely get to touch the radio. 
And if you're, <laughs> if you're smart, you'll listen. Amen? All right. Proverbs 16. We just read 18, but let's go to, in the New Living Translations, let's back up to Proverbs 16 and 16. How much better to get wisdom than gold and good judgment than silver? The path of, the, path of the virtuous leads away from evil. Uh, whoever follows the path is safe. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Better to live humbly with the poor uh, than to share uh, the plunder with the proud. Those who listen, here we go, those who listen to instruction will prosper. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. Don't you want to be happy and prosper? The wise are known for their understanding and pleasant words are persuasive. April says it this way. You get more bees with honey. <laughs> Just simple. When I watch her do what she does, not, not necessarily in any specific environment, but just period, in a pastoral care environment, any environment, when I watch her do what she does, it amazes me because she's showing Jesus. See, I'm good at this. This is what I'm good at. She tells me, she's like, you preach, pray, prophesy, that's what you do. You let me do everything else. <laughs> and she's right because that's what she's good at because she can get one-on-one -on -one and dig into the heart of who you are and show you your value in about 20 minutes. Where me, I'll take you to 35 scriptures on why. And then 20 more scriptures on how. But that's not my, this, this is what I do. But the truth is, we all have to learn our place. And you can't walk into somewhere and not know your environment if you don't know who you are. You know why? That my beautiful wife, and she's so uncomfortable right now that I'm doing this. You know why she can show people their value? Because it took her 20 years to dig her own out. That's right. And she's figured out if I can just get to here, they'll see it. Amen. She's eliminated all the fluff. Amen. And that's what she does right here. Sweetness of the lips increases learning. Now, let me give you some points. I'm just going to give you three points and then we're going to. We're going to go wrap this thing up. Point number one, how do I overcome me? Number one, you look to God. We've been talking about that up until right now. Do you really think that you're looking to God to everything? When you wake up in the morning and you're saying, oh, God, I hate my job, are you looking to God? Quiet. Y'all must all hate your job. Are you looking to God? Really? The truth is... Your job is not your source. It's not. It, it, listen, I know people don't like me to talk about money. And y'all are good about it, but I'm talking about other churches. But here's the thing. Your job is really just a means of seed. Amen. Your job is just to get your bills paid. Uh, just, and I'm talking about not, I don't have time to teach the whole thing. But God is your source for everything. God is using your job to get your bills paid and to give you money to sow into people's lives. Well, Pastor, I don't have enough to sow into people's lives. That's okay. We got to get past the mindset that everybody, uh, there, there's those that can give and those that can't. The Bible says that God will give seed to the sower, which means that if you don't have it, but you want to give it, God sees your heart, and eventually you'll hit a day where you're, you can hand it, you can put something in somebody's hands. I've given away buttons before. So this is not about me having more. This is not about money. This is having the heart to get close to him. And I'm finding out the closer I get to him, the more his stuff shows up. Amen. I chased, let, me, let me just tell you all something. I chased money for years and didn't get any. I quit on money and money started showing up. It's just an amazing thing. But you just have to start looking to God. Number two, it's, it's, it's 12.03. Y'all everybody okay? Number two, this is my favorite, listen to others. Quiet again. We live in a generation that doesn't have to listen. You can scroll right on by. Just keep going. Unless it's a picture, then you're like, oh, there's a squirrel. You know, that kind of thing. It catches your attention. <laughs> but you don't have to listen to anybody anymore. You don't, we don't even have conversations. We're waiting on somebody to stop and take a breath so we can talk. We don't know how to talk to one another. We talk at one another. And it gets so heated so fast because no, everybody's so incredibly thin-skinned, it's unbelievable. 
But the truth is this. You're that way because you're not in him. Because if you were solid in him, couldn't nobody really bother you. I've had people walk in here, sit in that office, and tell me, you are horrible at preaching. Well, they have. And you know what I said? You're right. But he called me. You didn't. You didn't. You can't even string. You can barely speak English. I'm like, yeah, but I can speak in tongues. I mean, what do you want me to say? And, and, their thing, and my, my point is this. They didn't come in here because they have a hope of taking this church from me because they can't. They just wanted to hurt. So the point is, the, when I say listen to, you, to others, you listen to people who are above you and want to help you. You learn to communicate with people who have something to put in you. I tell you, when I go to Canaan Land, especially the Becoming Center, I, the, my mantra is very simple. You have to change your playground and your playmates. If you can change your playground and your playmates and you get, to, you get to the place where your recess is now with the Lord, your life can change. Amen. At Canaan Land, I had a nickname. They call me, they call me No Recess because Pastor Allen don't play. That's what they call me. <laughs> then they call me Velvet Steel, which means I hit them real hard and I love them. You know. <laughs> but the truth is this. I, I, I don't have time to play with people's lives if they're about to throw it away. Amen. I have to get it to them. In whatever, whatever fashion that I can. But they have to listen. So you have to listen to God. You have to listen to others who can help you. And number three, this is, this is I'm going to try to land right here. This live a legacy. I didn't say leave a legacy. I said live a legacy. How do you live a legacy? It's real simple. Again, I'm going to use John. And I'm not, I would, I've done this have you not been here. They'll tell you that. John's legacy, I cannot tell you the stories. How many of y'all, my, how many of y'all have ever heard of the Iron Curtain? I ain't talking about football. The Iron Curtain. Hiding from KGB, going to churches where they're, I mean, he could have been killed in, in the, what, what was known as the Soviet Union for the things he's done to build churches and build the gospel and to build preachers. Because his job was to go minister to the preachers who were ready to quit. And he would go, it just the stories that I hear. He doesn't tell me these stories. Everybody else does. Yet he's sitting right here. He lives a legacy. He lives it. How do you, but he doesn't brag about it. Everything that I know of him, he never told me except for a few things. You got those grandparents that will drive from Dothan to Tennessee to watch you play a t-ball game. That's living a legacy. That's leaving something. That's rearranging our entire church for a ballet group to come in here and dance all around the stage. So for a memory, we're living a legacy. Rather than just say, we've gotten to the place where life is so fast that we don't do good things because we're trying, trying to do fast things. And, and what we got to understand is if you're going to not, you, you, you want to enjoy the legacy that you have. God gave you something special. God gave you an anointing and a grace to release it into this earth. And he gave it to you not only for you to give it, but for you to richly enjoy it. Amen. You get to live the legacy. My legacy is sonship. I'm called to take men and mold them back into sons of God. That's what I'm good. I'm not good at some of this other stuff. You put me at a round table with a bunch of pastors, I look like a redneck. But I know about football. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> But you put me in a room full of broken men, yeah. they need to get out of my way because this is what I do. I get to live that legacy. I get to stand in front of people and see the light go on Amen. when I take them to Romans 8 and 1 and say, there's therefore now no condemnation. See, you have been given something just like that. But you, you, what, what we've been trained in the church is to believe that as long as we're up here with a microphone, they have it. No, no, no. You have it. The greatest evangelistic association in Walker County should be the church. You should be out not preaching the gospel but living the gospel and letting that legacy come out of you and showing people Jesus. And when you get there, you realize it's not about you because you can't save nobody. You can't heal anybody. You can't deliver anybody. But you can sure show somebody. Amen. Now, I love you all enough to be brutally honest. I told you a few weeks ago, 
most of the church, including people in here, are intimidated to step out. The reason people are intimidated to step out, the word timid means that you've been intimidated in some area in your life. When you're timid to do anything, it means you've been intimidated, you've been put down, pushed down, hurt, whatever it was. And I'm just going to tell you something. Between my wife and me, you ain't never seen two jacked up messes in your life. God put us together and it was a mess for about 12 years. I tried to kill her every Thursday. (laughs) Y'all laugh all you want to. I think the last straw was when I threw that butcher knife at you and missed and was mad about it. That's when I realized it had gone too far. It had gone to, <laughs> I threw that knife and it went. And then I started cussing because I missed her. That's the truth. That's what God had to work with when we came to Jesus. Aren't you proud? <laughs> That's your pastor's. I can't even pick up a knife now that I don't think about that and my heart breaks. Because that's my number one earthly priority right there. Now, all y'all come later. And all right. And I've done all right. But she's it. Because I know who I am now. I was timid. People say, oh, I knew you. You weren't timid. Yeah, I was. Oh, I was loud and I'd fight you in a minute. But I was timid. Because I didn't know who I was. I lost my father when I was 12. My daddy never told me who I was. He told me I was his son, and he was proud of me, but for what? He wasn't there anymore. Let me tell you about men. Now, ladies, I can't speak to y'all because y'all are beautiful and wonderful in the eyes of the Lord. And we can't figure y'all out. (laughs) Don't y'all amen. What is wrong with y'all? Do not amen that. (laughs) But I know men. And men are very simple. Men have to know who they are. They have to know what their focus is. They have to know what they're good at. They have to know. If we don't know, we're random. If we don't know, we're lost. Now, we're simple. All we need is something hot and brown to eat. Football game. I wonder if football season misses me as much as I miss it. I just wonder. Because I like want to write it letters and stuff. I miss you so bad. Uh, no, I don't. I used to have it bad. It's all in your focus. It's all in knowing who you are. I had a friend of mine. He pastors a church down in South Alabama now, but he was a youth pastor at the church I trained at. He's running over 3,000 people now. Took a church of uh, 200 people, and he's running 3,000. And I'm not going to tell you his name. Some of y'all would know. He was a wonderful youth pastor. But we had a talk about football one time because I was as bad about football as he was. And he said, Alan, you know, I realized that my focus was off when Alabama lost. That tells you how long ago it was. Uh, When Alabama lost a game. Now, we're talking about Birmingham, Alabama. He lived in Birmingham. And he said, when I finally calmed down, I was in Tennessee. He just started driving. He said, I realized that I'd lost my first love. And God used that moment to show him, I didn't call you to be a football fanatic. I called you for something else. And something in him broke. And now he's running 3,000 people in South Alabama on the Gulf Coast, leading people to Jesus every Sunday. You can do that. But it's all in focus. One One last example. Focus brings blindness. Focus by its very nature brings blindness. Because if I'm sitting right here and I'm looking at Matt, right now if I'm looking at Matt, I can I see all of y'all. But the closer, if I got up on these chairs and just walked all, all past all y'all, the closer I, and I got to that sound booth and I'm leaning over talking to him, none of you exist anymore. Some of y'all are looking at Jesus, but you got so much. And you just got to get closer. You just got to get closer. And it's okay. Listen, it's okay to tell some people, hang on. It's okay to tell some people, not right now. It's okay, listen, it's okay to tell people no. It's okay. And it's also okay to tell Jesus yes. He's called you to a place to where if you're going to live a legacy, 
One last scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And we're going to end on this. <clears throat> Genesis 2, verse 7. Again, I'm reading New Living Translation. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed life into man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. The very breath that you breathe is still his. It's still his. And he still has a purpose for it coming out of you. He still has a moment in time that he needs to tell you something. And the truth is, sometimes we, we're timid, sometimes we're broken, sometimes we're hurt, sometimes we're angry, sometimes we don't understand, sometimes I just can't walk in that. What, everything I brought up today, we all have those moments, but the truth is, it's the people that push past those moments. Because I finally realized I can't. I'd, I've accomplished, I had money, I did all the things, but I was so, y'all, if I would have signed that record deal at 20 years old, I would be dead at 25 because I didn't know who I was. The enemy is trying to get you to stay focused on him by staying focused on your failure. He's wanting you to preach his gospel. Good news to him is how broken you are. But the good news says, I came for your brokenness, give it to me. And we get to put it back together. Amen, stand to your feet with me. Just bow your heads all across this place. <clears throat> I know you've been patient with us today, and I thank you for that. And Some of you have to, to go to work and different things, but right now, just bow your heads all across this room. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I know in my heart that I've preached what the Lord told me to preach today. I know in my heart that John talked about thankfulness for a reason. I know in my heart... I know in my heart that when they sang how great our minds can't comprehend but our heart gets to be in the middle of who he is. If you say to me, Pastor Allen, I do not know Jesus. Nobody's going to call you to the front. Nobody's going to embarrass you. I promise you that. I'm just going to ask you to put your hand up and right back down and then we're all going to pray together. But if you say, Pastor Allen, I need Jesus in my life. I, I need to give my life to him. I need to know who I am. On the count of three, just put your hands up and right back down. Nobody's looking around. One, two, three, all across the place. Amen. I see them. Put them right back down. There's hands going up. Any other hands? Amen. All right. Those of you who raised your hands in this entire church, repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for me. I accept salvation. I accept Jesus into my heart. You died for me, Lord. Teach me to live for you. Teach me to live in the blessing. Teach me who I am. And I'll promise to learn every day to be close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, people got saved. Amen, amen.